Good morning. Good morning. So, so good to see all of you here this morning and just celebrating our divine liturgy as you do every Sunday. I love, love, love uh, seeing all of you here and just t making it a, a principle in our own life that every Sunday we're just here giving glory and thanksgiving to God. So to thank you to all of you for being here. To those of you that are wor worshiping with us online, we love having you um, join our worship and join our worship virtually. We love having this, you know, one of the silver linings in this COVID pandemic, friends, is that um, it allowed people that would have never, ever experienced a Greek Orthodox worship an opportunity to do so. We have people every single Sunday tuning in from all over the world watching our services that probably never would have ever had that opportunity had it not been for COVID. And so we thank you from wherever you are at. We just thank you for making St. on the Divine uh, your spiritual home this morning. I want to get right into our sermon this morning. And, you know, last week or a couple of weeks ago, we began a new sermon series entitled Family Matters. And the premise behind this sermon series was this. You can always tell how important something is by the priority people place on it. You've heard me tell you that many times. You can always tell how important things are to people by the priority they place on it. We know in the very first chapter of the very first book in the Old Testament, God has a priority. He creates a family, Adam and Eve. And then we see in the New Testament, God again has a priority. In the very first chapter, in the very first book in the New Testament, God creates a family, Joseph, Mary, and then baby Jesus. And then we know that the very first miracle that Christ ever performs on planet Earth that is actually articulated in the Bible is again a coming together of a family at the wedding of Cana. God loves the family. The family matters to God, and it should matter to us. And today I want to give you the final part in this sermon series by talking to you today about our words. Imagine for a moment the greatest compliment that you ever received. Just take a moment and simply think about the greatest compliment maybe your husband gave you or your wife gave you. Maybe a compliment that your child told you once before or maybe for you children what your parents said. Just think for a moment what was that greatest words, that greatest compliment that someone gave you. And now I want you to take a moment to think about the most negative word that's ever been spoken over you. What did someone tell you? How has it impacted you? Whatever comes to your mind shows you the power of our words. Our words can heal a marriage or it can hurt it. Our, our words can elevate our children or it can decimate our children. Our words that come out of our mouth, our mouth can either bring healing or they can bring hurting. Our words have power. But don't believe me, let me just share with you some studies. Do you know that for every negative word that is spoken over you, it takes six positive words to get you back to where you were prior to that statement being made? So for every negative word that's said over you or that you say over someone, it takes six positive words to get you back to where you were before you made that statement. Now check this out, everyone. Lean in here for a second. Notice this. It's not one negative word and then one positive word erases it. It's not if I say something bad but then say something good, it's okay. No, it takes six positive words to simply get you back to where you were before that. Or how about what I shared with you last week? If you want to know how an argument or a conversation, better yet, is going to go, study how the first 120 seconds of that conversation is. How a conversation starts in the first 120 seconds determines the success of that conversation. That's the power of words. Let's go a little bit deeper. St. Basil, who writes one of our divine liturgies, a very good friend of St. John Chrysostom, whose liturgy we celebrate today, he says this in talking about the power of our words in relationships. He says, the most common, the most common and multifaceted sin between a husband and a wife, a parent to a child, a child to a parent, 
That most multifaceted sin is the sin of what comes out of our mouth in our words. Notice, it's not the big things that oftentimes we think are those things that are going to break up a marriage, sever a relationship with a child. It is the power of what's coming out of our mouth. So can I just give you all a little bit of encouragement today with my own words? Our words can change your family's world. Your words can lift your children up. Your words can bring healing to your wife, healing to your husband. And every one of you, I want you to start having this as part of your title. You're gonna state your name, comma, I'm a proud member of St. John the Divine, comma, I love the Lord, he's my savior, I love our church, comma, and then these three letters, you guys ready for them? You've all been given a promotion this morning. The letters to your name are this, C-E-O. Every one of you have just gotten a promotion. You children, you're CEOs. Wives, you're CEOs. Husbands, you are CEOs. So Father Nick, what does CEO mean? Thank you so much for asking that question. The CEO means this. All of us are the chief encouragement officer of our family. We're all the chief encouragement officer of our family because our words have power. I want you to open up your Bibles. We're going to look at the Gospel of Matthew today. We're going to be looking on page 17. For those of you that are tuning in, we're looking at the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 12, verses 36 and 37. This, everyone, needs to be what I oftentimes tell you, a refrigerator Bible verse. Christ is speaking to the Pharisees, people of faith. And he's talking to them about what it should look like when you're a Christian, when you're a follower of God. And listen to how he says it. We're going to be looking at chapter 12, verses 36 to 37, on page 17 of your yellow Bibles. Here we go, everyone. Take a deep breath and listen to this. You can be sure. Like, there's no ambiguity. Like, you can be sure, this is Christ, these are the red letters in the Bible, that on that judgment day, everyone will have to give account of every useless word they have ever spoken. Like if you're ever doubting the power of our words, God is saying, hey, listen, I love you. I'm going to die on the cross shortly for you. But on the day of judgment, the book's going to be open and said, uh, Nick, what, was, what did you mean by that? And why did you say that? We will give account of every useless word. Your words will be used, again, everyone, the power of our words. Your words will be used to judge you. Like these are self-inflicted wounds that come out of our mouth. To declare you either innocent or guilty. It's powerful. Our words can change our world. So what do we do? What do we as a church, how do we truly become, not in some corny way, but like how do we truly become CEOs? How do we become chief encouragement officers? One word, everyone. The word is this, grace. It is grace. It is giving a spiritual free gift of love and compassion. But I know that's not good enough for you, so let me go a little bit deeper. And I want you to remember the letters that make up the word grace. G-R-A-C-E. And I'm going to share with you what I hope are some practical principles you can do with your spouse today, with your children today, with your parents, that will hopefully allow you all to be true CEOs. G. We need to start sharing words of gratitude. I had a couple come in to my office, I won't obviously share with you who they were, a couple weeks back, and the wife said this to me, almost exactly word for word. She's like, Father, I don't need him to always tell me thank you, but just once in a while, just once in a while, I'd love for him to simply see what I'm doing, just tell me thanks. Like, am I asking, this is an exact statement, Father, am I asking too much? 
for him simply to say, thank you, thank you for the dinner, thank you for cleaning the dishes, thank you for taking the kids, am I asking too much? And maybe some of you in this church can relate to that wife or to that husband for that matter. Some of us just simply need to hear someone say, I see you and I thank you. R, be respectful. Our words should be filled with respect. In psychology, they've defined three different ways of communication. Because our problem is not, is not that we don't communicate, it's how we communicate. See if any of these apply to any of you. Probably not, but let's just imagine for a moment. Some people are avoiders. These are people that love to get the silent treatment. I just simply am going to avoid the conflict. I heard this funny story about this couple. I love sharing this story, by the way. The husband and wife were in an argument. They didn't really want to talk to each other. They knew when they were sleeping in the bed together, they wouldn't even let their toes touch the other person's toe. They were not like, they just didn't even want to acknowledge their presence. So the husband tells his wife in a post-it note, honey, wake me up tomorrow morning. I have a flight at 5 a.m. Puts it right next to her nightstand. He goes to bed. Following morning, he wakes up at 9 a.m., gets up in a rage, goes to his wife and says, I told you, didn't you see the note that says to wake me up at 5 a.m.? I have a flight to do. She said, honey, go look at your nightstand. He goes and looks over it. There's a little post that says, wake up, it's 5 a.m. <laughs> but none of you are like that. But just, all this, just in case you may know someone who's like that, an avoider, it's a way that we communicate. Or maybe some of you may be yellers. My gosh, you just think, hey, the louder I get, the more effective I am. None of you are like that, but some other people are. But maybe you just like to yell. And, Father, this is just the way I was raised, this is the way I grew up, and we're just yellers. Not realizing that the most effective way of communication is whispering. If you really want to make someone truly hear what you're saying, stop screaming. Start whispering. And then there's the criticizer. Always critical. Oh, always finding the bad things. Always focusing in on the negative. Again, none of you are that way. But constantly looking that way. The Bible says this. If you want to be a Christian, the fruits of what that tree looks like says this. You outdo your wife. Outdo your husband. Outdo your children. Outdo your parents in showing honor and respect to one another. Outdo one another with showing respect. Here's A, affirm. Start affirming what your spouse and your children are good at. My gosh, how we focus so much on the negative, not just even amongst family, but even in our society, just always focusing on what they're not. Why don't you start focusing on what they are? Start affirming the way God has made them. Some of us are putting our husband on our potter's wheel or our wife and say, you need to be this way or be that way. No, God didn't make them that way. He made them in his image, not yours. We need to speak words of, you know, I think you're so great at this. Just got a great personality. You know, in that setting, I'm not a very, I'm much of an introvert, but the way that you talk out loud, I just love how you, are, you carry the conversation. You find words of affirmation. Wives, let me tell you one thing, just so that you all know. Study after study after study tells us that men love words of affirmation. They love it when their spouse says, you rock, like you're great at this. They love words of affirmation. Here's C, be courteous. Be courteous to one another. I did some research recently on all the things that Christ speaks so much about, what he dislikes the most. Three of those six dislikes all have to do with words. So listen to what St. John Chrysostom says about our words and why we should think before we speak. He says, God has surrounded the tongue with a double wall. That's this, our lips. A barrier of teeth, this, and the fence of lips, in order that we may not easily and heedlessly 
utter words that we should never, ever speak. Like God gives us all these tools to just keep our mouth quiet. Mother Teresa says it this way. She says, when being courteous is saying that words which do not give light of Christ to others increases the darkness. Are you a CEO by giving light or by giving darkness? And finally, E, empathize. Have empathy for your spouse or for your children and for your parents. Our minds naturally gravitate towards the negative. In fact, in our brains, there's more space for the negativity than the positivity. So I'm just encouraging you, show empathy. Every time your sister, your, your sister or siblings make a mistake, every time your wife or husband makes a mistake, listen to me, mistakes are not life sentences, they are life lessons. They're not life sentences, they're life lessons. I want you all to be CEOs. I leave you with this. I love to share stories that inspire you. And I read this story this past week and it inspired me. It was about a young boy that was born in Ohio in 1847. This young boy, well, like most young kids, I can relate to it in some ways, just could never sit still. And would always talk a lot and would always want to just be the class clown. Um, oftentimes would kind of be a little bit disruptive in school. But he was there and his mom would always just love on him. But one day he went to school and as when he was in school, as he was leaving the classroom, the teacher said, son, wait a second. And she handed him a letter. She says, don't you read that letter? This letter is for your mother to read when you get home. So he takes the letter and kind of curious as to what that is in that letter. He takes it home and gives it to his mom. His mom opens the envelope, takes the card out, and she begins reading this letter. As she's reading this letter, she starts to cry. She's reading this letter sentence by sentence and begins to simply cry. The young boy says, Mom, what is it that's in that letter? What is the teacher saying? Why are you crying? She says, the teacher said that you're a genius, that you're the bright kid, like you are going places. She said, you're so smart and so bright that our school, they can't even take care of you. Like, I'm going to be the one to have to teach you because you're smarter than all the teachers. This young boy was like, me? That smart? Those words were so powerful that he ended up following what those words shared over him. He'd end up doing extraordinary things in his life. But a decade later, his mom passed away. She died, and as he was cleaning out the closet and the drawers, he opened one drawer. The very back of that drawer was that card that that teacher gave. He took out that card, and he opened it up. He read what she said, and he too began crying. Because the letter didn't say what his mother said. It said this. Your child is not bright. He does not have what it takes. All the other kids are smarter than him. He's got some mental issue, some mental problem. You just need to take him home because we're not going to teach him anymore. He is, check this out, expelled from this school. And that young boy just simply began to cry because he knew that he would have never gotten anywhere had the words of that teacher been read by his mother. Do you know who I'm talking about? In his life, he would have 1,000 inventions. His greatest invention was a light bulb. Talking about Thomas Edison. His mother's words catapulted him to another level. And my encouragement for all of you is to share words of grace. Tell your wife, your husband today, how grateful you are. Be respectful. Affirm each other, be courteous to one another, and simply be empathetic. I'm just going to step into your shoes, because our words can change our family's world. So all of you know right now, you've been given the promotion. Every one of you are chief encouragement officers. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.